Test, test, one, two. Is it good? Okay, sweet. Uh, hello, everyone who may be joining us uh, after the live stream, if you're coming back to watch this video. Uh, we started the stream a little early, so we'll get started in about seven-ish minutes. So if you want to go ahead and skip ahead uh, five to seven minutes or so uh, in the video, um, that'll be when we start diving into the content. So yeah, see you soon.
All right. Um, well, we'll go ahead and get started because uh, we've got a lot of stuff. Um, and I will do my best to go concisely, uh, but clearly. Hey, Joe. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean to call you out. I just didn't say hello to you before you walked in. Um, so this is a, a little presentation. Uh, I was attended a conference uh, this past weekend. Uh, a lot of you know kind of the announcement that I gave, but um, it dealt with a lot of very real issues and real things that um, some serious topics that a lot of people are dealing with. Uh, my particular interest was just working with a lot of like the younger folks of our congregation, our youth and young adults, because they're they're super relevant. They're super relevant conversations around that. Um, but I also think it's, it's super helpful information in general. Um, so just to kind of give a little bit of a flow uh, to do some sort of structure for this evening, um, I recognize that this can be hard to read, especially for you watching online. Um, so I'll do my best to read everything that is on the screen, um, just so everybody, everybody has it. Um, but so the general feel of, of how the evening is kind of going to go is um, there were several sections over the conference that dealt with specific topics. Um, is that me? It wasn't doing that before, was it? Yeah, Italian word. Okay, how's that? Sweet. All right, so far so good. Um, so the general, the general flow of uh, how the the evening's kind of gonna, I'll try to have the evening go. Um, um, you know what? I don't know where I put. I'm sorry. I. Okay. <laughs> All right. My apologies. Um, so the general feel for how um, we'll kind of set up the evening, um, there were different sessions that were main four-hour sessions uh, over the weekend, and they each kind of dealt with a main theme or topic. Um, so I'm going to do my best to kind of give a quick summary of everything that was discussed um, during there. Thank you so much. <laughs> Um, and thank you for knowing like exactly what I was talking about. If I just where did I set that? Um, so I'll also to try to distill all the information. I'll be be trying to take my biggest takeaway from that particular session, um, and then also sharing the most impactful quote that I felt uh, kind of encapsulated the the in general um, theme. And then after that, uh, we'll have a, a time for, for Q&A um, at the end. Um, a couple things as we uh, head into it. Um, for those who are watching online especially, but also folks uh, here, um, we do have this set up uh, for questions um, for a couple reasons. One, because it's something that you can log into and send questions right away so that you don't have to try to keep it in your head. Obviously, you can write it down as well. But if you think of something and you want to send it out, um, you can do that. Um, this is also an opportunity for you live folks um, and people watching uh, to ask questions because I'm not able to look at the, the feed, but I will be able to check the content that is um, submitted through these questions. The other thing that's nice about it is um, you have the option to submit a question anonymously if you would like, which I know um, with some of these topics, there can be some sensitivity and um, uh, we want to approach that with gentleness. And I also know that for the more reserved, quiet of us here, um, 
that can be a nice option to, to ask a question without having to like raise your hand and, and uh, talk in, in front of everybody. So either way is fine in terms of, of asking questions, but I do ask that we'll kind of cover those uh, at the end um, and we'll, we'll just have a, a good time there. Uh, that'll keep the flow going a little easier than kind of pausing every so often. <coughs> Uh, a couple last notes uh, before we begin. Um, so the purpose, my purpose for, for kind of doing this when, when Pastor Brian and I were talking about it was one, uh, so that I could present and kind of distill the stuff that I experienced and, and learned and, and, and encountered there uh, to everyone here. But the other purpose was that I hope that this is kind of a, a helpful starting grounds to at least kind of spur some conversations and thoughts and openness to engaging with these topics in the future. Um, there's a lot of content to try to boil down into an hour-ish or so. Uh, if you notice, I did not put a, an end time on this event. Uh, so if you have to leave, uh, no offense, uh, we'll be taken at all. If you, if you gotta get up and go, you'll be able to watch the live stream uh, back if you, if you wanna catch something you missed. Uh, no offense uh, whatsoever if that is the case. Uh, also, being that there are some more difficult topics that we'll be talking with, I'll do my best to present them humbly and gently, but if there is something that is, is tough and, and you need a breather or um, you need a chance to, to step out, by all means, um, do that. Um, and then the last thing I wanna iterate is especially the summary section is not a, a slight disclaimer that a lot of times it may, will be things that I, I do, I did resonate with and agree with what the speakers presented on, but the summary is a summary, not an opinion piece. So keep in mind that as I try to summarize it, I'm trying to be as faithful to the content that I heard and not necessarily, oh, these are all the points that David vibes with. Um, so just keep that in mind and also keep in mind that um, I may not be able to give like all the answers or to perfectly distill the full picture of 20 plus hours um, in, a little, in a little bit. So if there's a question or something, this is something that I would love to do. If there's a question or a comment or a topic that you wanna talk about more or need a more in-depth answer, or if it's just something like, hey, yeah, let's figure this out and, and pursue this together, um, hit me up and we'll like grab coffee sometime and we can talk about it and, and chat and read a book. Mike and I have done that. It's a fun time. Um, so I do just ask that uh, that grace would be uh, extended to me in advance uh, in case I, I, whether I misspeak or I don't give a, a super clear um, answer, we'll try to, to do the best that I can. And then hopefully this is a springboard to other comments in the future. So a uh, quick gist about the conference. It's hosted by Preston Sprinkle, who is, um, despite his quite amusing last name, um, yeah, he is a, he's an author. He's written um, about, I think it's 12 books on a variety of these topics. He hosts a podcast called Theology in the Raw, um, which is an excellent uh, resource. And a lot of the people who presented at this conference have been on this podcast in different interviews. Um, and the purpose of this podcast, and thus the, the entire conference, was to bring in people to engage in these real conversations from a biblical, biblical foundation. I've read one of, of Preston's books. I have another one. Uh, it's called Embodied. It's about transgender identity in the church. Fantastic book. Those of you who follow Dave's book nook, uh, it'll be not in this month, but the next month's uh, subtle plug. Um, and, but, so, very active in addressing a lot of these topics. Um, and then the other thing is he's the president of the Center for Faith, Sexuality, and Gender. So he works a lot with uh, Christians and individuals in the LGBTQ community to wrestle through um, what that relationship looks like uh, between Christ and then um, these uh, between sexual and, and gender identity. So a lot of stuff from him I would, I would recommend because he's, he's an excellent resource. He's right in the thick of it. Um, the general gist of the, uh, the conference uh, is to be a Christian is to be an exile. The Bible is a name for the country we've been exiled to, a Babylon. As exiles living in Babylon, we need to think biblically, Christianly, 
and indeed exilically, not partisanly, through cultural and political issues. That was kind of the, the main tagline of the conference. Um, it was hosted at Calvary Chapel in Boise, Idaho, uh, which is a beautiful drive. Um, I made it about four chapters in a, uh, an audio book before I had to switch to music uh, because I was losing my energy there. But it was a cross-denominational gathering, um, and I kind of touched on the, the purpose as well. It was to challenge people to, to really engage with these topics. They were clear going into it. You're probably going to hear some things that you disagree with. Um, but the ultimate goal is we're going to lift up Christ as supreme and try to humbly approach these subjects in ways that are beneficial and, and help us actually wrestle with these things and grow. <coughs> uh, a couple things that I really valued, and I promise we're getting to the actual content, but a couple things that I really valued just in general was, first of all, um, I loved the fact that there is a space to have these open and honest and just raw conversations about really serious things. I think that's something that I know I crave a lot and from a lot of the youth and young adults that I talk to is especially in the context of the church, having a space where you can ask really difficult questions and not necessarily find the answer right away, um, but having people willing to walk alongside you, give, maybe give the I don't know, um, or even, hey, we'll figure this out together, I think is incredibly valuable. And they demonstrated that at this conference. Um, There's some really good questions and there's a, a, a very open um, approach to things. I also appreciated the, the variety of perspectives. Uh, it seemed, at least to me, from encountering the people that presented and the people there, people were really passionate about Jesus. And there wasn't necessarily any like super contrary things like that were really clashing, but there were different tones and, and varieties in, in how people approach different issues. And I felt that was helpful because that's ultimately education is refining what you believe with evaluating it against other things. Um, and another thing that is not on here, but that I just really appreciated, was every single session started with worship. Um, it was a really beautiful thing. Uh, both Kate and Brian got to watch the, the first day um, of the conference, and the, the worship that opened it was, it was just a really cool experience to be in a place where people from all over different denominations, but all coming and lifting up the name of Jesus. And I thought it was a really good place to start entering into these conversations by recognizing who we are and, and who the one we're praising and seeking to serve is. So without further ado, uh, let's jump into the juicy stuff. I actually, I said that, or I said spicy, I think, in one of the services. And I <laughs> afterwards, Kate was like, why did you say spicy? I was like, well, I meant like, you know, it's a hot topic. And she's like, well, then say that. <laughs> um, but what can I say? So the, uh, the, first, uh, the first session dealt with uh, the political landscape. So political exiles um, as, as Christians we, we find ourselves in. Um, as Christians, we live as, as exiles in uh, a foreign empire and akin to the Israelites when they were in, in Babylon. There was this sense of there, this displacement of not being where they're truly home um, and not being in the, the place that was familiar, that they were accustomed to. A lot of changes were going around them. Um, this is likened to really strongly in the New Testament. There's this really strong theme of our citizenship being found in heaven uh, in Philippians 3, 3.20. Um, that passage up there in, in 1 Peter talks really directly about as Christians, we're, we're foreigners living in this land because ultimately our, our home and our allegiance um, is, to, is to Christ. Um, and so the, one of the main pushes of this session was that reclaiming this central kind of exile Christian identity is, is vital as we approach the political sphere because um, of the incredible polarization when we have these sides on all sorts of issues pulling us uh, in certain directions to think certain ways without that anchor of who we are and where our ultimate allegiance lies, that becomes a very volatile state to be in. They also made the point that the exileness wasn't necessarily a bad thing. Um, that there were Israelites who, who stayed in Babylon even after they were allowed to go back because they were like, well, I mean, I have a, it's not bad. Like, I've got a job, a business, and, and a house. Um, and then even when 
the exiles did return, Israel was not the same after that. They rebuilt the temple, uh, but, but God did not come back to dwell in, in the temple space. And uh, there was still this displacement because they were still under authority. They were paying taxes. Um, they were, were subject to Bab- Babylon and Greece and Rome, and there's always this other power. Um, but so as Christians, in a, in a thinking about ourselves through this lens, that ultimately our sole allegiance is to Christ as king. Um, and that the rhythm of our lives are not dictated by the Babylon around us, but rather the rhythms of the kingdom of heaven. Um, and the same in that, that if Jesus is king, um, Caesar is not. It was really interesting, one of the things that they did share that I did not know, Pastor Brian, you may have, you watched this session, so you may have known this already, but the word gospel, the good news, um, was even kind of a politically charged term at the day in the Roman Empire, in the sense that it was used to talk about the accomplishments of and the success of the Roman government, specifically the Caesars. And in fact, there was a, a document that they shared that when Caesar Augustus was born, um, one Roman historian wrote, uh, this is God himself uh, incarnate, and thus begins the gospel of Julius Caesar. And the guy presenting was like, You don't think that that was in John Mark's head as he's writing the Gospel of Mark starting, this is the Son of God, the good news. Um, He's kind of taken this language that the Roman Babylon around them was using and pushing it towards our allegiance. There's a greater allegiance here going on. So that was the gist, the summary of kind of this first session was this, this stance that we have of our ultimate allegiance to Christ, not in the particular government or country that we, we currently reside in. Um, again, my um, key takeaway is, is our central and sole allegiance to Jesus Christ has massive countercultural implications with how we think about and address um, the situations and people of our world. Um, the key quotes that I thought really stood out to me and, and really uh, hit me were when you give your sole allegiance to Jesus, this has massive political implications with how we view Babylon's attempt to rule the world, at least a slice of it. Want to vote for the Babylonian Republican? Okay. The Babylonian Democrat? All right. Uh, He went on to say the Babylonian Kanye. Um, Not that I would advise uh, voting for Kanye. But another thing, too, for these, uh, this PowerPoint I can also make accessible if you want uh, me to email this to you. Afterwards, just let me know. And that the one that really like knocked me down a bit uh, was uh, if the rhetoric of a certain Babylonian party causes you to love your neighbor less, then you may be giving more allegiance to Babylon's Messiah than you realize. Um, and that really, really hit me because I think that it is really prevalent that uh, even if there is a certain party um, that we feel. Uh, conveys strong values, the implications and the, the way that it causes us to look at and interact with people, especially of the other camp, is not a loving um, attempt. So that's section number one. Again, summary, key takeaway, main quotes. Um, if you have questions, you can, can submit them or jot them down, uh, and we'll, we'll keep, on, keep on rolling if that sounds good. <coughs> Uh, second one, uh, unity in the church. Uh, it's, it was funny to me that this was like on the same tier, not on the same tier, but like in a conference that dealt with like a lot of serious topics that this was like serious enough that they're like, yeah, we need to include this too. Um, and I, I'll be super honest, the first, this presenter was the main reason that I initially went to the conference. Um, Francis Chan was the speaker who gave here, and those of you who don't know him, uh, he's an author and pastor, and he's, he's one of my favorite speakers and authors. Uh, he's had a, a pretty big impact on my faith just through the books and the sermons that I've read and listened to. In fact, I own every single one of his books, so if you want to borrow them, uh, come and uh, hit me up. But so... I was really surprised when he came out and he started talking because, uh, and Brian can attest to this, uh, as he started going, I was like, man, this sounds really, really uh, familiar. So he comes out, 
Um, and keep in mind, this is coming from a wide variety of denominations who do not share the same view of communion. But he comes out and he sets the Eucharist out in front of, of the whole congregation, uh, or the whole assembly of people there. And he said, do you know that for, for 1,500 years, this was like the center of the, the service. Like when Christians gathered, this was front and center as a reminder. And this was why we gathered, because we got to encounter the presence of Christ. He's like, I can't explain how it happens, but somehow Jesus is present here, and that's the focus. And he was like, and then they started to, to slowly move um, the pulpit to the center and the sacrament to the side, and they started, oh, well, this is just a symbol. But he was like, for so long in the church, when they gathered, this is what they gathered around. And I, I was sitting there just like, preach it, brother. <laughs> like, Pastor Brian says that every Sunday morning. <laughs> um, so a little bit of self-righteousness there. But I thought it was really powerful that he pointed out just the, the centrality of communion, even to the point that it was, um, it was at the cent- front and center of, of the church. And how one of the ways that it made possible for Christians so often to come together in despite of differences, whether that be political differences or socioeconomic differences, was this fact that we know who we're gathering around. Um, I also, he also likened it to the analogy of the Holy of Holies of the New Testament. We're in the Old Testament. To enter God's presence, that was one guy once a year got to do that, and he had to take all these steps. But because of the work that Christ accomplished on the cross, we get to have this Holy of Holies experience um, with Jesus. In this mystery, um, every single time we commune, um, he also went on to, to talk about the importance of, of revering and treating um, people across denominationally as, as brothers and sisters in Christ. And I, this was something that I do think is really important because I think quite often um, we sometimes neglect the fact that the Holy Spirit himself dwells in, in these people. And there are certain, certainly some issues to divide over, but sometimes we make the battles of a lot more than we should. And we kind of push away somebody who may not be of the same denomination, failing to recognize, hey, the Holy Spirit is actively um, at work uh, in this person's lives. I'm going to see them as a brother uh, or a sister. He goes on to then kind of talk about um, that there is a good caution in discerning false teaching and, and false doctrine. And there are certain things that divide up. But while we're equally cautious about that, or while we're cautious about that, we need to be equally cautious of those that um, we just reject unity and fellowship with. Because um, the, the Father actively wants his church to be united. It, it grieves him deeply that his, his people are not. And if God wants something this much, um, his people as well should. Um, he also touched on the fact that unity is relational. It's very easy to kind of point at the others and um, without knowing people in that, that sphere. Um, this is something that I've experienced firsthand, and I don't know if uh, she might be watching or watching later. But So my sister uh, is a Roman Catholic, and I will tell you, I have learned so much about Roman Catholicism over the past couple of years because she, she converted a couple of years ago. Um, just from conversations, and we do not see eye to eye on everything by any means, but um, just the the amount that I have just grown in my understanding and through that relationship has really deepened my appreciation for the Catholic faith. Now, that's not to say I'm going to go running off and, and become Catholic. Uh, don't worry, Pastor Brian. <laughs> um, but... It, it has led to a, a, a deep sense of, of, of unity. And there, there are definitely times where we're in a conversation and I just kind of want to be like, oh, are you serious? Sorry if you're watching, Marie. But like, come on, that's not what the, the text says there. Um, but because that relationship is there, the unity can survive the tension that occurs. And I think that's a really important thing. Um, and it also, uh, it comes with a cost because there will be people who, um, kind of cast out those who, who try to associate with with or build that unity um, between other believers. Um, Francis describes this as uh, sometimes that he's experienced, um, even just sharing the stage with some other people he's lost friendships with. 
um, because they're like, well, you're on the stage with this person, so you're clearly in line with this. And um, So there is a cost. And again, not to say that there's not a place for discernment, but there needs to be, I think, an equal caution between the desire for unity, which God longs for, and the desire for truth, which God longs for. Um, and then ultimately, kind of coming back full circle to communion, is true unity happens when Christ is at the center. When there are two people pursuing him, um, that unity is possible, which, which is, is part of the ways that maybe like my sister and I can have those conversations um, is because we, we do our best. We get into the weeds a decent amount, but we do our best to, to keep Christ front and center. So um, key takeaway, before we label someone as a heretic or a false teacher or we try to just avoid them and, and keep as far from contact with them as we can, take the time to know a person and try to look for and discern the fruit of the Spirit in their life. Um, And then the the key quote that really hit me was, it is my prayer that you would see that God wants us to be perfectly one, and that you will make noise and make a fool of yourself fighting for something that God wants so badly. Um, One really amusing thing, well, there's a couple kind of funky things that happened during his presentation, but one that I'll just share um, just as a, a source of, of laughter, um, is at one point he was like, I need to, like, we need to get Christ back in the center of things. We need to d- decrease. I need to decrease. And then his mic cut out. And it, like, died. And he had to get another mic. But just the timing of, I must decrease. God's like, I got you. <laughs> You're decreased. <laughs> but, so that was, uh, that was kind of that section. So we had the, the political identity kind of living as an exile into uh, church unity. Um, all right. Uh, so now uh, the third session um, was a little more, um, it was a different flavor of topic. Um, and I want to preface this by saying that this is something that is, um, this is a, a topic that is sensitive, and it takes a lot of grace and gentleness and patience talking about, and is also one that is is fairly close to my heart because I do uh, know quite a few people um, who wrestle with with these things in in various degrees. Um, So I'll do my best to be clear uh, and loving and, and straightforward as I as I present, um, and special thanks because this is the section that I need this for. Um, so this section focused on predominantly on the stories of, of five, five different people, um, each with, with different experiences in the LGBTQ uh, community. Um, the first of these is, uh, was Jackie Hill Perry. Um, she wrote a book which... Um, Kate's reading right now, and I'm, I'm going to try to read when she finishes, called Gay Girl, Good God, which is the st- her story of um, living in the, the homosexual community uh, and then coming to Christ and what that's looked like her, uh, what that has looked like for her um, since then. Um, she had a, a really profound story because she's lived in a, in a she lived kind of both sides of that coin, if, if you want to phrase it that way, that she knows what it's like to be right in the middle of actively pursuing relationships with, with other women. Um, but her testimony of, of finding Christ and um, uh, that, what that journey of following him has looked like. Um, and now she's, she's married uh, to her husband, and I think, she, well, she shared they just had celebrated the birth of like their third child. Um, but I really appreciated the, the vulnerability um, that, that she was willing to share. Um, Greg Coles was another uh, speaker. He um, shared about his um, uh, constant um, wrestling with uh, a desire. He, he liked other, other guys and was attracted to, to other guys. Um, his um, life, I think, is a really profound example that, again, he had some really faithful people walk alongside him to, to figure this out. Um, and now he, he shared, my attraction is the same, but uh, my commitment to Christ and to a celibate life is um, how I live my life. Um, and he, he, he had a pretty 
pretty fun um, presentation because he kind of opened it with saying, he's like, I remember um, in youth group, we got, uh, they separated us boys and girls, and um, he he shared that, yeah, and they, they kind of said, all right, you guys, you got to be on watch because um, you're, you're going to have to brace yourself because pretty soon, like, you're going to start getting these feelings, and you're going to be experiencing these different things uh, with girls, and you need to watch, and he's like, all right, so I braced for it, and I braced for it, and I braced for it. Uh, he's like, and it never came, and I was like, I, either I'm very unique and holier than thou, because I'm not struggling with these things, um, but he went on to, to share that it was something that he wrestled with, and he, he really measured his, um, he measured his status in the eyes of, of Christ based on um, how heterosexual he was feeling um, in the moment. Um, he said the three biggest discoveries that he, he made along this journey to, to being committed as, as living in a, a celibate lifestyle was there's no biblical guarantee that his attractions would be changed um, and that the conversation around it um, is complicated. But he was incredibly grateful for um, the fact that he had people who walked alongside him to help him um, learn what does it mean um, to follow uh, Jesus faithfully. Uh, it was also a little, little bit of a bummer because he was like, and all, for all you dudes out there, just saying you're not that attractive. I was like, oh, shot to the heart. <laughs> um, uh, that's okay because Kate thinks I'm attractive, so we worked. Um, but so I, I really appreciated him, him just being willing to, to be open and honest in that fashion. The third story was Kyla uh, Gillespie. I think I pronounced that correctly. Um, but she began her testimony, uh, experience with um, gender dysphoria, that she described as being so hard um, that she could barely breathe at times. There was just this internal just war going on, and she just, it was borderline um, unbearable. Um, so she uh, transitioned um, from female to male, uh, and lived as a male for five years. Um, and she described that people during that time uh, modeled for her what Christ uh, was like, and they walked alongside her. She said that even as she really started wrestling uh, with, with Jesus and with this new identity um, and how those two related, she said, I felt the, that God was calling me to... Um, to look into transitioning back to a female. Um, but she said, the thing that solidified for me was that my church came alongside me and took care of not only like prayerful support, but she said a couple from the church took me into their home um, while I was, I was still a male. And they provided for like the housing and food. They took care of my material needs and the church helped to fund the transition surgery back. Um, I thought that um, that was just a, a really powerful example of um, stewarding someone's story and walking with them towards um, the direction. It's not an instantaneous, well, you got to get this figured out right away. Um, Joanna Marie um, shared about how she wrestled with a really long time um, with um, living as a, uh, with bisexual desires. Um, she said that she had a really difficult time uh, growing up in the church because there wasn't necessarily a place for her to articulate what she was going through. Um, when she did share it and the few times that it did come up, it was something that was shut down really quick. It was, hey, this is not God's design. Get it figured out. Um, she then went on to share some aspects about, okay, so how then does a church help foster a, a biblical and truth-based approach, but that doesn't create that sense of um, displacement for a person wrestling with that, which was one of my major takeaways, so I'll get to that in a little bit. And then finally, uh, Tony Scarcello is another individual who um, uh, wrestled with, with homosexuality for a long time, now committed to, to celibacy, but... He um, shared that he believed that his family and his church would rather have him dead than know 
the turmoil that he was going through inside. Um, and that rather than see him live that, they would rather him just be not exist entirely. Um, he had a really powerful statement um, about kind of his deconstructed from faith, um, walked away from the church, but had a couple committed people uh, who stayed committed to him through that time um, and helped him rebuild a foundation um, on Jesus and on the gospel. Um, and again, he, he had a really, really powerful thing that I'll, I'll share in a, a moment here as well. Um, so the key takeaways... Um, if the church simply gets upset about issues of sexuality and gender and the increase of prominence of the LGBTQ community, but doesn't work to create safe communities of love and listening for teens, we're not embodying Christ because people will search for community when they don't have one or don't find one. Um, this is something, again, that the theme of the whole conference really struck me. And I don't necessarily have the answer on how to do this well yet. Uh, I'm still processing the in my brain. But working with a lot of like our young people and kids, um, part of my thing is, well, how then can I help foster this? How can our church foster a place where, where kids can be open and honest about a struggle that, like as they described, um, was so difficult at times it was hard to breathe or that they wrestle with. I feel like if they knew really what was going on, they would rather I just wasn't a part at all. Um, but I think that that's a really, I did think that was a really prominent point that it's easy to get frustrated or upset or cling to, hey, this is the truth. This is what we need to, um, which is good. But then how do we foster a place where there actually can be healing? Um and I'll come back to the practical tips because I just realized I missed that. Um, this is another thing that I thought was really prominent was behind the concepts and arguments and discussions about homosexuality and uh, transgender experiences are real people with real pain and real struggles. Um, and that really hit me hearing the testimony of these five people because I think a lot of times we can make things concepts and really go tooth and nail about them. Um, and uh, really kind of this is it can in a very kind of callous way um, because we forget the people behind the stories and that doesn't necessarily negate the truth that's being said but it makes the truth very unpalatable um, and then this is something that, that Jackie Hill Perry ended with but Ultimately, all of us, regardless of what our, our sexual desires are, whatever our temptations are, um, let God, not the body, have the final word in how you live. Um, so a couple of the things that they shared is in terms of practical tips. Again, this is back on the summary side. Um, Romans 2.4 talks about uh, the kindness of God will turn hearts to repentance. Uh, and so one of the presenters shared, if you really do care about somebody, um, in any kind of sin, but in this particular instance, um, somebody who is, is living in the LGBTQ lifestyle, um, if you truly seek repentance and want that person to know the love of Christ, a good question to ask yourself is, am I kind? Am I being kind about this? Um, because if Christ and the Holy Spirit dwells in us, um, equipping us to be his representatives, the kindness that we show them is the kindness of God. Um, something else that was there to start with the beautiful, a lot of times it's really easy to come in with the law and swing and, and take things down. Um, he said, start with, with the beauty of, of the image bearersness, the fact that we have this, this beautiful humanity that's given by God, that God himself took upon himself, um, a place of grace to begin the conversation is much more effective than, uh, starting with what's, what is wrong or what is outside of. Um, design. Um, another thing is, is that I thought was really potent was equipping people to deal with temptation uh, is going to require having conversations. And there is a same in that don't assume that your kids or friends are not, are not going to struggle with their sexuality. Um, and I thought that is, is really prominent, especially in the church when we interact. I think a lot of times we assume oh, well, my, my kid, my friend, this person will be fine. Um, but the reality is, is it's a very real thing, and, and kids need to 
everyone <laughs> needs to be equipped on, on how do I wrestle with, with these things. And the place that I start, I think, is a place where there's open conversation with people. Um, the language and stories, I know I'm spending more time on this one than the other one, but this was one of the more relevant and uh, intriguing ones um, to me. Um, but the language and stories, this was, was kind of interesting um, because, let's see if I can get to the right page of my notes. Um, somebody shared, he was like, Christians need to stop using the Sodom and Gomorrah story in conversations with people about this topic. He said, maybe in a theological uh, podium where you're duking it out about whether or not this is right or wrong in the first place, that's, there's a place for that. But he's like, if you go to a kid who is wrestling with this and you say, well, hey, look at Sodom and Gomorrah, they're going to read that story and be like, that's not at all what I'm dealing with inside. Um, and so it kind of very much escalates the situation, and, and it really is not super helpful, which I found, I found to be kind of interesting. Um, another thing that kind of hit me was, was somebody said, the phrase, love the sinner, hate the sin, um, needs to, to stop. And the phrase, the, if you followed that by saying, when was the last time you heard that in regards to any other cop topic outside of sexuality? And I kind of sat there for a minute, and I was like, well, like, okay, like, to be fair, I don't think that it's necessarily a maliciously intended phrase by any means. I think the people that use it aren't necessarily um, bad, but he said it's never used in any other context. And he's like, it, it radiates a self-righteousness of, I'm not the sinner. I'm going to love the sinner, but I'm going I'm to hate what's going on here. His proposed alternative, which I really, really, really appreciated, was instead of love the sinner, hate the sin, Love the sinner, hate your own sin, and let's run like hell to Jesus together. <laughs> I was like, that's, that's pretty good. And he also uh, presented another alternative being, hey, I'm a beggar showing another beggar where the bread is. Um, and so, again, it's not necessarily the most major thing, but it was something that I, I know I've definitely used before and thought about having the conversation. I was like, okay, that's nice to hear from somebody who has been in the midst of these experiences and has this um, to share their perspective of how that, that can often come across. And again, I don't think that it's often always um, offered in a self-righteous um, uh, place, but... I think sometimes it, it can be um, because it is a way for us to, to look, to not look at what's going on here. The last thing I wanted to touch about here um, had to do with the language because this for me, and I'll, I'll say this right from the get-go, this for me is something that I'm still wrestling with. Um, and it's the, whole, the pronoun question because this is something that came up um, a lot during um, this conversation. And it was interesting. This was one where there was kind of more extremes on, on how people approach the issue. Um, but what I did find was, was really interesting was one of the individuals, um, Greg Coles, um, his, his take on it was that language and ling language can be used as, as hospitality. Um, and I thought that was an interesting concept. And what he meant by that was um, when we t use the words and pronouns, we typically are using them in very different ways to begin with. So we said a great place is to comp not antagonistically, but just ask, like, okay, like, help me understand why this is, like, the important, important thing for you. Um, so he, he offered that rather than being a concession to something that I disagreed with, it's a way for me to kind of bring an olive branch um, of keeping this relationship open and healthy. And his, he continued to say, because the minute that um, you say, well, no, I'm not going to use that, well, that relationship is likely going to be done. Um, is That's one perspective. That was the one that, that Greg offered. There was another, others offered that, well, I think that that's, that's too um, Babylonian for the, to keeping with the theme. That's, that's too much in line with going along with what it was. So Kind of an interesting dichotomy there, um, and I, I did appreciate though the um, the the multi perspectives on it, um, and coming from two pe from people who are in the midst of it, um, 
who love Jesus and are, are trying to pursue Jesus as fully as they can, and they come to different conclusions with it. Um, again, uh, we can always come back to slides, and um, I can send the PowerPoint out. Um, but so major quotes, um, take time in the books, but take time out of the books. Actually aim to know LGBTQ folks with no other agenda than to learn their story. You may know the truth, but you may yet need to learn how to love. Um, the only way to run well is to look at Jesus often, whether you're helping somebody through something um, or you yourself are working to figure things out. Um, this is the thing that Tony said on the bottom that I thought was, was really profound, is Jesus will see you not necessarily by changing your attractions, uh, the issues, or church history. And I think what he meant by that was how the church has treated you in the past. Um, but by redeeming and restoring your soul to him. And then finally, and this was one that uh, is one that I have not really been able to get out of my head since the conference, and that's um, if you want to know how to foster a church community for queer people to learn how to live their lives in a manner faithful to Christ, ask yourself three questions. Are people able to be out of the closet and honest about their struggle and not be despised? Are there mature Christians willing to live along, walk alongside these people? And are the material needs of these people met? Um, that's, again, I'm not going to say at all that I have the answers to how to do that well, uh, but it's something that I think that um, is worth a lot of thinking about and, and kind of pursuing. Um, keep it on going. I'll try to go a little quicker so we can get to some questions. Um, the next uh, one was on um, uh, critical race theory, race, and forgiveness. Um, so we... Uh, we did not let up uh, all day, I tell you. Um, so kind of the summary here is that it's important to have an emotional context for a conversation that you yourself do not necessarily experience. Um, you need to understand the problem in the situation um, personally. This was made really uh, prominent to me in this conversation because they had an... Uh, a hip hop, a Christian hip hop and um, spoken word artist come and he did a couple spoken word pieces and one of the lines that he said was, um, when I show you my pain, you show me a statistic. Um, and that really hit because I think a lot of times, especially people, some of us who are more logically inclined, will like to lean towards the numbers and whatnot rather than necessarily stepping into the messiness of something like a story or someone's personal experience. Um, so that was kind of the, the opening kind of context set over the conversation. Um, they had an individual come out who, his name was Ed something Skeety or something very odd like Swedish name, um, but who had a doctorate degree in critical race theory, uh, and the most interesting thing that I found about it was that he himself was white. Um, not to say that it's impossible, but I was just like, huh, that's interesting. He actually even acknowledged, he was like, I was the only white guy in my um, doctorate program, uh, and you could tell. <laughs> but, so it was really interesting, because I'll admit, this is not something that a topic that I'm super familiar with, but um, his, uh, what he shared was the basic definition of critical race theory is uh, the system and practice of examining the effects of ethnic and racial divisions in history, public policy, and social interaction, both in the past and its impact in the current time. Um, and I think in, in terms of a raw definition, I mean, that, that makes sense. And I, I think that all of us pretty much anybody would hear that and be like, okay, like, that makes sense. Like, I can understand that. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, but then the initial thing, and you could even see it, like, in the comments um, after he said that. It was like, but what about, um, and then he said this. He says, when a theory is born, it goes in search of an application. He's like, and that's where some of the, the, the problems can kind of arise. He shared that the inherent theory itself is a helpful tool of evaluation um, but you see on kind of both sides um, extreme versions of an application. On the one side, you have something saying, well, like all whites are a problem. 
the totem pole now. Uh, we're flipping this thing around. Um, he said on the other extreme um, is kind of this approach that, well, this, this is destroying our history and, and disregarding everything that we have, we have covered and believed. Um, and he said that but what, what it lacks is the, the gospel um, application to it. So if, we, if this is a theory, how do we combine with this with the gospel? And that's kind of what the other presenters got into. Um, a couple other things that they shared was um, don't ask a person of color to speak for all of their group. Um, that was something that I think is pretty good because I think for anything, a lot of times if we can find that token person to fit our worldview, uh, we're like, sweet, boom, there. Um, this person says what I believe rather than, okay, I'm going to listen to a lot, a lot of voices here and then try to formulate um, an understanding from that. And I think, I mean, it's, it's pretty clear if you just, even in this room, like we're all, we're all white in this room, I think we'd have some pretty vastly different opinions on different things. Where the best place to get coffee is, Didi and I would probably not see eye to eye on. <laughs> um, that's a, it's a trivial example, but I thought that was a really good point that, again, the importance of listening and learning the stories. Um, and then they, they drove home to, um, so as we're looking at a history that does include a lot of time with, with slavery and uh, racial discrimination, how does the gospel speak to this? Um, the gospel and the multi-ethnic thread are kind of woven together from the beginning um, with the Gentiles being welcomed into the family of Israel. There's this sense that um, this message unifies in a way that no other thing can. Both Babylonian parties will try to, to kind of say there are certain things, and then we're concerned that they can't solve the problem. Why is there still racial tension? Um, and, and coming away from this conversation, I was thinking, well, maybe it's because the only thing that really can draw these divides to a close is the gospel, and it's been doing it for 2,000 years. Um, this was another one that I thought was kind of interesting because there were several very differing opinions shared, but um, it also kind of rolled back on, um, as Christians, we oftentimes take, uh, um, for we don't take forgiveness seriously despite being commanded to and despite the fact that it brings life. And she said this can go both ways in the conversation, um, whether it's how um, we look back and, okay, how do we move forward in a way that is, is good? Um, how does forgiveness play a part for people that may not that have had a, inter, any interaction with those systems in the past? Um, how does this happen when it's offered to people who may unintentionally offend someone or, or commit like an aggression or something? How does forgiveness fit in? And ultimately, that's really the only way is a, is a radical gospel approach of I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to listen and I'm going to view you kind of back to Francis Chan thing as a, see the Holy Spirit dwelling within you. Um, apologize if I'm going a little quick. I want to be respectful of time. Um, my key takeaway was I need to listen more. Um, <laughs> we got done from this session and I was like, holy cow, I feel like I just like scratched the coin. Um, I needed to, to listen to more voices and read more books on this before... Um, I even pretend to say I have an answer to a lot of these things. Um, again, the, when I showed you my pain, you showed me a statistic. And then another quote that I thought was really profound was, you didn't know because you didn't know the problem personally. And I think even beyond the conversation of racism or an injustice like that, a lot of us can kind of recognize times where um, we have either we have a harder time identifying with someone because we have n really no reference point to what they're going through or somebody trying to like speak to a situation that we're experiencing and without giving us the opportunity to share the story in the first place. So the last main session uh, was on the nature of hell. Um, there were two views of hell that were presented and debated. One person presented, then another individual presented, then they critiqued each other, um, and then they um, fielded questions. So the one view was eternal conscious torment uh, with differing levels of torment. Um, the uh, eternal conscious torment. Um, so this idea being that after judgment, day, those who are cast into hell will, will suffer 
uh, and be in pain and anguish for the rest of eternity. Um, the conditional immortality view, which was the view of the other, which was the view of the other individual, was that immortality is a gift, and hell is the exclusion from all life, and thus from God itself. His uh, take is synonymous with annihilation, uh, which would be that those who are condemned, they suffer, and then they're, they're destroyed. It's an eternal consequence in the sense that you're not coming back to life because you're, you're gone. Um, and uh, the Greek word that's often used, I think in particular in the Gospel of Matthew, he said, for burn up, which is usually what's used in the conversation around hell, um, the word means completely destroy or reduce to ashes. Um, now, my big takeaway from this is, is this really as relevant as any of the other topics we've been talking about? <laughs> um, I got done, and I remember I called Kate, and I was like, I mean, it was interesting, I guess, but, like, compared to the other things, like, this was a kind of a low note to end the conference on, and, like, I, I, I guess it's significant, like, if somebody is really struggling with the idea that a good God could eternally like cause somebody to suffer. I guess that it's a debate worth having because if like the conditional mortality is true, but I, I don't know. I kind of got done with it. Sorry, Scott. I kind of got done with it and I was just like, okay, like as long as we're admitting that, acknowledging that hell exists, like can we like not spend three hours on this? Um, Cause I, and then this was a takeaway that wasn't said, but this was kind of my, my thing is our call to share the gospel is more powerful when it's motivated, not primarily to save people from hell, but rather to introduce people to the goodness and beauty of God. Um, not that it's not a nice perk of knowing Jesus, but I think that that motivation, helping people just to see how great God is, is much more effective than trying to scare somebody into behaving a certain way or, or following a certain thing because um, hell exists. Also, it was really interesting going into this conversation because I expected like to really kind of be on the, the eternal conscious torment uh, view. Um, and to be totally honest, after the presentation, I'm not, I'm not really even sure what I think because he did not have a good <laughs> presentation. I uh, did not think it was very clear. He had a couple statements he threw out there, and I was like, I don't, what? Um, and then this guy comes out, and I was expecting him to be like, oh, this is going to be a flimsy argument. And he just like starts busting out the Greek. And he's like, yes, yeah, so this word is found in all these instances. And it translates to this, which is, and I'm just sitting there just like, wow, okay. Again, this is interesting, but I don't know if it's super, super relevant. But it was, it was an interesting conversation. Um, I guess it'd be, if you're really interested, it'd be something looking forward to more. Um, um, no, he was, uh, he said he was a Calvinist, and that was, that was all that I knew about him. But he's got a website called Rethinking Hell, if you want to, to check it out. Um, it was interesting, I, I kind of, yeah, I don't know, again, like I was, I, I was bummed the one guy didn't do a very good job, but I was also like, at this point, it's not super worth it. But also, I guess, in summary, um, so these are the, the topics and themes that were covered um, were, were really significant. And again, this was an hour summary of, of hours. So I am absolutely hope that this sparks more conversations, whether it's over coffee, drop in my office, among you and people who are watching online. Because I think that it's, it's a good place to explore is how can we best love the people that um, God has placed in our lives. Um, and how do we best uh, stay faithful to truth and, and pursue all these things? Because I think it's something that is going to take a lot of humility, a lot of listening, and a lot of willingness to admit, okay, maybe I don't have this figured out fully yet. Um, as Christians in the midst of a culture of shame, angst, and polarization, we can lead by humbly showing the world and younger people a compelling alternative to the chaos that is experiencing um, in the world around us. Um, serious times do call for a serious response, uh, and this is why I do think this conference was really relevant, um, because it dealt with the seriousness that we're, we're seeing. It wasn't kind of an ignoring, okay, these things are happening, but at least in our church, we're not encountering this. Um, the, one of the hugest things that I got done was like, I need to listen and read a whole lot more. 
like in all of these things, like whether it's podcasts, um, scripture, um, I, I like listening is, is, and that's something they modeled really well there, but it was like, man, I need to, to listen more. And then ultimately, all of this is worth many, many long walks, prayers, and cups of coffee. So uh, a little Dave touch for you there at the end. Uh, now we get to the juicy part. Um, so we might not get to any question. Uh, it's about 8 o'clock, so I went about an hour. I said five minutes per session, um, so I confess my apology um, that I did not stick to that. But looks like we have a couple questions up here. Um, does anybody here have one that they would like to, to ask before we return to these? Yeah. Um, so let me just repeat the question for the uh, live folks. So the question is, uh, elaborate more on what you mean by, by struggling with, with pronouns. Um, and so I guess like the issue is, are you asking predominantly like for the people, why people might be wrestling with it, or like where I personally am kind of... Are you saying that you struggle with pronouns, or people struggle with pronouns? Oh, no, I, I do not in the terms that I'm totally fine with he, him. Okay. Yeah, yeah, no. Um, uh, no, I, I, what I mean by, yeah, struggling with, if I, if I did say I'm struggling with it, is I'm kind of wrestling with the balance of um, what is the better route to go. And I don't know that I personally have that figured out yet. Um, of is it better? and more helpful, at least in certain contexts, to use the, the pronouns that the people that I'm speaking with would prefer to kind of, again, offer that olive branch? Or is that kind of more acquiescing to something in like a concession? So if I did say I'm struggling with it, it's that tension of which is the better route to take. And it may be depending on the context type of a thing, but yeah. <coughs> um, let me go to one of these and then um, uh, we, I'll come back to, to the room. So this one question here, in your opinion, ooh. <laughs> in your opinion, how long will we be in Babylon or is it a permanent state for us as Christians? Uh, I guess my, my opinion would be that it, as long as we're in this world and this life, we'll be in Babylon. Um, like one day when, when Christ comes back and the world is restored, I think, yeah, we'll be finally home, finally where we ultimately belong, where our citizenship is. But I would say that, yeah, as, as long as we are here, we'll be in, in Babylon. That's not to say Babylon can't be nice sometimes. Um, heck, even at the conference, I did a little hike that kind of showed the view, view of Boise, and Babylon looked pretty good from up there. Uh, but, yeah, no, I, I think that we will be. Um, another question I see here, which I can easily answer, is what is your favorite Francis Chan book? Uh, I used to always say Crazy Love, but Until Unity, probably his most recent one, probably passed it as my favorite one. Um, so if you're curious on reading it, again, I have both, but I would say Until Unity is my favorite, but Crazy Love was for a very long time. So <coughs> uh, I'll try to keep switching back and forth. So any other questions um, here? And if they're submitted on here, I can go back to the tablet as well. Ooh. Yeah, uh, so if out of all the presenters, if there's one person that I would say, read this book, um, it would be this individual. That's a really good question. Yeah. Um. Mm. What's that? Don't, don't yeah. <laughs> I would say, well, I, I don't, I'd, I'd want to, s- mm. 
Honestly, or just based on the presenters? Oh, man. Either either um, Jackie Hill Perry or Derwin Gray, depending if you want the Derwin Gray uh, presented in the, the race conversation. He's a pastor um, and a previous football linebacker. So he is one that I would love to learn more about. Or Jackie Hill Perry is the one who wrote Gay Girl, Good God, which I have not read yet, but I've heard really good things about that book. Um, as far as books that I have read, I mean, Preston Smith, like he writes really, really well. Smith. Oh, I keep on calling him Preston Smith, who is a Packers player. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, no, Preston Sprinkle. He's also, I, I just finished his book, Embodied, which is very, 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 very good. That's a really good question. Um, let's see. Um, <clears throat> in a culture, oh, this is a good question. In a culture of people protesting and causing a scene when people talk about controversial topics, was there ever a time like that in this conference? There was not. And I think that that was a profound testament to the posture that both the presenters took, but also the people there. And I honestly think that just the fact that it was centered around Christ and it was ba like every time like we opened and closed with, with worship, I think that, that that did a really big, big thing. I attended the conference alone, which for an external processor was a little rough. Um, so I didn't necessarily have anyone right away afterwards to be like, hey, what did you think about this? And I don't know, maybe in some groups that came with larger groups, there was more of kind of like, a, no, like I don't, I don't click with that at all. But I think a lot of people took the posture of, hey, I'm here to learn. I know I'm going to probably get challenged in some ways. Um, and I'm going to think about it without necessarily getting hurt or anything like that. And I think that there was a, a gentleness that was shown in approaching the topics as well. Um, Sure, yeah, that's a good question. So the my question was, was were both um, conservative and uh, liberal traditions, right, Christianity traditions, um, represented? And was there a, kind of a space or a response of their own perspectives on the topics given? Is that a fair kind of summary? Um, I don't know exactly. Um, it definitely, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know exactly what the makeup of, of everyone was. My guess would be that there was a wide scope of people based on just some of the, the comments that, like, Preston even offered of, hey, like, I know we've got people here who are still kind of figuring out the Jesus thing, and this is one of the places where they saw some of these questions could get answered. Um, if I had to guess, I would say that some of the more... Um, I don't like using the word, but like the, the more liberal views, I'd say actually I'm really probably the both extremes were not terribly present, at least in the presentations. Um, there wasn't like, there wasn't so, like, for example, like there wasn't anybody at least presenting who was like, um, the Bible is, is fully in support of um, homosexual marriage. Like, so that wasn't, there may have been people in the crowd who believed that, but I think part of the posture that was, was taken was a, a traditional marriage stance. Um, does that kind of answer your question? So I'm not entirely sure. But, and then there also wasn't, like, um, there, there wasn't, like, the, the conservative extreme either. In fact, my guess would be that um, as someone in the LCMS, I was probably coming from one of the more conservative traditions there. So that would be, that'd be my, my guess, a rough answer to the question. Who is conservative extreme? Who, 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 who do you think that is? Um, well, so like in, in the terms of um, 
So if in like the, the racism conversation, um, like kind of the, the denial of the reality of like the effects of racism permeating still today. Um, there's kind of like a, a more extreme sense that, hey, yeah, these things are in the past, they don't affect us, there's not any kind of changes or systemic issues that need to be addressed and kind of handled. Um, in terms of like the, the sexuality conversation, um, I think the, the people that, the more conservative approach would be like, nope, the Bible says it's a sin, it's clearly a sin, end of story. Um, and any sort of participation in a conversation or anything beyond that is a concession of truth would be kind of the approach that I would articulate, I would articulate with that. <coughs> um, let's see, a couple more questions here. Um, <coughs> if we create safe spaces for people who struggle with sexuality and gender, how can we make sure that this doesn't create more problems with other teens? Hmm. That's a good question. Yeah, uh, if we create safe spaces for people who struggle with sexuality and gender, how can we also make sure that this doesn't create more problems with other teens? Um, that is something that I wrestle with, and I do not have a complete answer yet. I do think that creating a space like that in the church isn't inherently going to be a problem because m most kids are going to be exposed to it, and at least having one side of the conversation. Um, so I think as long as there's like a clarity in and transparency in what we're talking about in terms of we're not gonna like we're gonna be clear hey this is um we want you to to flourish in all that god made you to be and we don't believe that this is this is that particular way that you're gonna be able to flourish the best um i think if, if it's framed in that way so that the people who are a part of that conversation or that space no okay this isn't something that we're just saying hey this is a space for you to come and, and do whatever you want um, but if, if kids know kids are smart um, and they're good at, at helping and walking alongside each other um, and so I think if they exp if if it's clear from the beginning that hey this is a place that we're going to uphold certain values I think that they can still be done without necessarily worrying about the harm but that's just my on the spot reaction because I do not have a perfect answer to that question. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, and even beyond like a sexual temptation, but hey, this person is sharing this, I can finally share that like I've been wrestling with like X, Y, Z. That's a good point. <coughs> uh, looks like uh, last two questions here. Um, one, were you already familiar with Preston's podcast? I was, but I hadn't listened to it extensively. Um, I'd heard a couple episodes um, here and there. Um, and then finally, last question, which is a good one. While loving those who are questioning or actively living in the LGBTQ world, what about those who are not? How do we avoid making sexuality issues all-encompassing? Okay, I think I see what that, that question is saying. What do we about those who are not covered? I think that that is, that is really valid, and I think that is one thing that the church has done. This is something that I, I, I feel very strongly about this. I think the church has done a disservice by elevating sexual sin um, as if it is worse, that, which I guess if you're the ECT, uh, different levels of how punishment, you might make a case that it, that it is. But I think that it, it has made too much of an emphasis on those sins as being worse 
Uh, whereas if you read the epistles, like Paul lays out some of like the, the sexual sins right next to gossip and slander, um, which are very, very present. And so I think that part of the way that we, we talk of cannot make it all encompassing um, is to recognize the, the reality of um, the presence and the, equal, the equalness of, of the sin that we see around us. Um, and I think that, again, it's, um, it's knowing your audience, too. I don't know. This may be almost a better question for you, unless you ask this. Um, <laughs> but I think it's, it's kind of knowing your audience. Um, and so I think that there's a time and a place for it. It might not necessarily be that, hey, Pastor Brian's going to do a six-week sermon series on, like, this subject, whatever it is, whether it's race or, or porn or uh, homosexuality or whatever, but I think there can be a creative way to come up with a place where it's not something that is um, all-encompassing of, all. Oh, this is all that this church is about, um, but a, a place where people know that if they need that, they can go there. That's a really rough answer. I don't know who asked that because it was anonymous, but I hope that's somewhat satisfactory, and if it's not, track me down and be like, yo, I need more on that answer, so, but... All right, uh, well, I guess I did not answer this question, and then we'll pray and close it out. Um, what was one thing you were confronted, challenged with, uh, where you thought God's word and my assessment of an issue may not be lined up? Um, that is a really good one, and I, I, I will have to say that the initial one that comes to mind um, is the is the hell conversation, just because I went into it really thinking like, oh, the Bible is pretty clear about this one. Like, it's, it's the eternal conscious torment, um, which is a really brutal name for that, but I guess it's a brutal thing. So, <laughs> um, But I went into it with that, and then after watching that dude like n hammer out the Greek the way that he did, I was like, yeah, I don't know. I don't know, and that's going to be my answer now. I don't know the answer to that question, at least not yet. Um, so that would be one. And then I also think that the other one that I was challenged on, because I thought I was at a, a place in terms of using pronouns, um, uh, the people's preferred pronouns, I thought I was at a place where, okay, I think I know um, where scripture and where, where what I should do with this. Um, and that was much that I'm not going to do the, I'm not going to use pr the, the pronouns of choice. Um, I moved a little bit the other direction after attending, just hearing some of the stories of people who are in the midst of it, um, who are also really pursuing Jesus and what they heard when they, when people did or did not use their pronouns, which made me much more kind of in the middle ground. Um, which, if you ask uh, my wife or Pastor Brian, is tends to be the place where I land with like everything. So, <laughs> um, but. But yeah. Um. yeah is, is there, <coughs> can, can this argument from these other hell issues, you know, like the, the Greek and this stuff, is that available to, to listen to or to read? I believe so, actually. I know, I mean, he, and he, so he, that guy actually shows up on Theology in the Raw podcast. Um, so that can be a place. His name is Chris Date. Um, Chris Date, yeah. Yep. So if you're interested, his website is Rethinking Hell, which he probably goes through a lot of the content there. Um, but I think he also did mention, though, that the, the PowerPoint presentation that he was giving at the conference was available on his website as well. Um, so I, if you're on the website, Maybe just look for something like Exiles in Babylon or something like that for the, the conference. But yeah. But let's pray. Um, and then, yeah, we can thank you guys for coming. I really appreciate uh, those of you who are coming and tuning in um, just because I know that, that it, it just shows me that, hey, like you guys do care about these things and, and how do we think about and engage with these. So um, I hope this was a blessing to you and it wasn't just boring or unhelpful hearing me yammer for an hour and a half. Um, and again, by all means, hit me up about anything because I'm all for um, talking and, and conversing more about it. So...
Uh, dear precious Father, uh, Lord, I thank you so much for the gift of your Son and this amazing, um, wondrous calling that we have to be her, your hands and feet um, here in this broken and hurting world, this Babylon. Lord, let our allegiance to you be um, first and foremost in our lives, um, and let us be filled and guided by your Holy Spirit so that when we encounter these difficult situations and we encounter people different from us with different stories and experiences, that we would have the ears to listen and to listen well, to truly know them, um, and to, to run like crazy to you with them. Um, thank you for the amazing gift of forgiveness that you give to us that covers our sins and our failings and our inability to show grace about these topics or our, uh, um, or the, our concessions that we make on these topics that you cover it all with, with the blood of Christ. So we thank you, Lord. We ask that you would fill us and um, anchor us in the goodness of uh, your son, Jesus Christ, and his work on the cross. And all this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.